Sponsored by WinWing Technologies. Once again, another bright idea that balances versatility and realism. Hello everyone and welcome. Today it's myself and pilot uh, Dave Padders. Say hello. Hello, how are we doing? Uh, today's a very exciting day. It's firstly a lovely day at the end of April in uh, 2022. And look at this glorious UK sunshine we've got here. Barely a knot of wind and just a lovely day, which is great. And today, much more importantly, we're flying the mighty Harvard, um, known to some of you guys as the T6 Texan in America. Um, and I'd, we just watched Dave fly over our head and land and it was just awesome. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. We've had cancellations as we always yeah, do yeah. due to British weather, but we're ready to go. So Dave, um, let's start things along with a, a little look around. So if you've seen the other videos we've done on the Spitfire and the Hurricane, we're generally talking that technology. So it's 1930s, late 1930s yeah. tech. 36, I believe, the first T6 flew in its mm -hmm. original guise. Before that, you had the uh, the Yale, uh, which you'll find the only example in Europe in um, in Duxford. It's, it has a fixed undercarriage and a yeah. smaller engine. Okay. Uh, the one we're operating here, T6 Harvard. This one was built in '53, yeah. uh, and it served for the Italian Air Force. Um, it's a nine-cylinder Pratt and Whitney radio engine, 660 horsepower. Is that a Wasp? It is a Wasp. Yeah. How about the single Wasp. We've got to have a little yeah, look. Have a look. All those nine cylinders. Wow. In terms of size, in terms of kind of radial size, is that the same? kind of size as a double wasp or yes. it, so a double wow. wasp would be a wasp with two right okay so ac3 engine or the wasp here yeah, just strapped two together yeah right how interesting wow i've always wanted to that's one of the reasons why it sounds so chunky and cool then absolutely a nice little point while we're here if you dive in just here Pew. when they made the engines they always put a dime yeah. or a nickel whichever like american denomination that is yeah. um, with the date of the engine is it on there? Is the date on there? Uh, it is. It is 2017. This engine was overhauled. Oh, oh right, overhauled. Right, yeah. So you suck a new one over the top. And Whitney, look, ping. Look at that. Amazing. Okay, it's a thunking great wasp in there. Out of interest, does it have a capacity, a known capacity? Uh, okay. It does. I don't know it off no. the top of my head, I'm afraid. It's American six, six really horse. Big. Yeah, it's big. Yeah. Big engine. Wow. Well, this is a real upgrade from our last aircraft we flew. 145 horsepower. We've now. Uh, quadrupled it <laughs> we have yeah so the chipmunk we're flying along around yeah. about seven imperial gallons an hour yeah this we're flying at about 50 us gallons an hour uh, planning fuel so that's when we're aerobatting it full yeah. power uh, and you get this piddly little propeller as you can see it doesn't I, go that, far outside the uh, the radius of the fuselage the first thing i noticed when it came in was how small the propeller is compared to something like a spit or hurricane mm. where you know you're going to absolutely maximize the radius of the prop why does that have such a small prop it's just the the one they stuck on it you, you, you'll notice when it takes off off, um, you get that rasping sound when, yeah. when the power's at full. And that's because mm. the tips are going supersonic. Right. So it's about the longest propeller you can get for this gear of engine. So the speed right. is turning. Uh, the only way to, to rectify that would be to have a reduction gearbox on there and start yeah. complicating the aircraft, which yeah. this isn't designed for. Uh, yeah. It's designed as an advanced trainer, keep it simple, keep right. them flying, and get guys from Tiger Moths or PT-17s into yeah. this and onto fighters. That's the whole idea and of it. And these were really mass produced, weren't they, over oh, the they were, yeah. couple of decades? Yeah, like, thousands of these yeah. things built. Oh, interesting. Right, okay, so that's kind of the business end, if you like. Pretty chunky end. So yeah. compared to the chipmunk we looked at, and we, we have these on the Spitfire and the Hurricane. You can't see them because the great big spinners on the front. Mm -hmm, but this mm -hmm. is our uh, propeller governor uh, weights here. So yeah. when we're controlling the pitch of the propeller blades, okay. we're pumping oil into the cylinder here yeah. and using the governor blades to to turn the propeller. So yeah. it turns the pitch of the, the, the blades. So if you look at the leading edge twist here, for example, yeah. this is now in it's in its course pitch as we parked it. Yeah. Um, so that's minimum revs, if you like. And when we take off, we'll be turning that blade round to more mm -hmm. of a, a flat angle to the air, so a, a, a finer pitch. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the whole blade basically twists around that way and that's all through there all through the governor and is that manual is that automatic in this case it's manual for well it's, it's a constant speed propeller so you set the uh, position of the lever for yeah. the rpm you want yeah. and it maintains the rpm through the flight regime right so once we set it for aeros we don't touch it gotcha um unless you overspeed it and then you have to start fiddling with it but yeah we won't be doing that today okay very good right let's move on shall we yeah. undercarriage they're, they're kind of they're sturdy but stumpy. <laughs> Is that, am I right? In yeah, absolutely, that? and and they're solid as well. They're yeah. designed for people that really shouldn't Noobs. be able to fly that well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's, it's a big chunky airplane. You'll notice, like the Hurricane, it's a wide track undercarriage yes, right. as opposed to the Spitfire. That's, that's narrow. Great. That's narrow great, track. isn't it? Yeah. Um, doesn't mean it's not squirrely. Um, yeah. You'll probably see me struggling to keep it straight at times on the runway today. Is it, um, is it quite a squat in terms of length? Or is it is, yeah. Eyes? yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a fairly short aeroplane, mm -hmm. and especially the front end here. When, when you see it in the air, it looks like it's got you know, a, a mm. pit bull kind of shoulders. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. wings, the wing roots are very close to the propeller. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not that balanced look you get with the fighters yeah. and with, with the chipmunk, for example, with the longer nose. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Great big exhaust along the side. You'll see different versions of this depending on the type of Harvard you're flying. Yeah. So this one is actually a Harvard. It's built by the Canadian Car Foundry. Right. Uh, it's a Harvard Mark IV. So the Canadians called it Harvard as well. That's yes. Right, yeah. It? The British and, and the Commonwealth called it Harvard. The mm -hmm. Americans called it Texan, right. or SNJ, or T6, mm -hmm. or any other denomination you want to, want to choose. <laughs> yeah. So the Navy versions with the SNJs, they had tail hooks and strength on the carriages because yeah. they operate on carriers and for deck landing practice. Mm -hmm. T6, I think, was the Air Force version, which wasn't the strength and version. Mm -hmm. And then Harvard was the British designation, and we didn't bother with the Navy version. Yeah, I've just noticed this is is this actually Wacky Wabbit, or is this is that just named? It's just named Wacky Wabbit. I was going to say, yeah, yeah so I was reading about Wacky Wabbit, right? Okay. In terms of wings, one thing I notice about it in the air, especially considering its length, is it's got a very large wingspan. Mm. Like, I guess that's because of its trainer training role. Yeah, so you're up at the Hurricane Spitfire kind of wingspans. You're up around about 32, 33 feet yeah. um, in wingspan. Um, it's quite a high wing loading. It weighs uh, 2.4 tons or 2400 kilos yeah. um, and for this size of wing really it's, it's quite heavily loaded so you'll yeah. notice when we when we go flying later we'll do some max rate turns to yeah. departure yeah. and it will flick out quite nicely when we do that because it nice. will just overload the wing and flick out okay. um, so, and that, that's what makes this airplane quite challenging compared to the chipmunk with a very low wing loading yeah. you can throw that thing around and it looks after you all the way through and when yeah. it does let go it's fairly benign yeah. uh, this if you push it too far it doesn't really warn you the chipmunk has that lovely buffet as you come towards okay. the saw and shakes and buffets for ages yeah. saying I'm going to do something in a minute it. This just goes, I'm flying, I'm flying. I might not fly, I'm not flying. Uh, it's, it's just had enough. And so the chipmunks is l less than half the weight, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's um, 990 kilos. Right, so yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Just, it's less than half the weight. This is, this is truly American in that case. Yeah. Let's see, it's got a bit of wing sweep on it, hasn't it? Oh, just it has, a yeah. touch. Yeah, it's it not awful. Lot. It's, yeah, it's noticeable yeah. when you're in the air. Yeah. Certainly when it flies over. Yeah. Thickness of wing. Is that a thick wing or a thin wing or somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. It's, yeah, it's, not, it's not a high performance wing. It's yeah. not your fighter wing, but it's, no. it does the job. Yeah. Uh, compared to the Hurricane, we had a great big wing route on there. This yeah. is, this is yeah. quite a bit smaller yeah. uh, route wise on, 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 the, on the thickness wise. Right, okay. This is our pitot probe. So our yeah. airspeed uh, pressure probe goes in here. Now we're all metal, aren't we? We're all metal, yeah. Uh, wow. From the flight controls themselves. Yeah, so right. So that's one Spitfire Hurricane, so we're fabric flight controls. That would be typical, wouldn't it? Yeah. I was reading, in fact, I think you told me about this, but I was reading as well at some point on some aircraft with these, it won't affect this because it doesn't go fast enough, but on some aircraft when you, you get kind of uh, ballooning of this material. That's right, yep. yep. Yeah. So you get the, the pressures going over the fabrics so as, you, as you deflect them into the airflow. Yeah. You not only get it pushing in and, and yeah. deflecting, but you, you also get this, the, the pressures changing right. and blowing the fabric up, right. distorts the flight controls basically, it yeah. makes them spongy. Right, okay. Um, as I've moved that, you see we've got a great big servo tab on this. Yeah. Is that a trim tab? It's a servo tab, so it actually moves opposite to the aileron. Why and is that? it accelerates, it helps, it, it makes it lighter on the controls. Huh. So the airflow, if we, if we move the aileron this way, as the airflow hits the bottom, it pushes the aileron yeah. up. So it makes it lighter on the stick. How about that? And if you move it the other way, that will start moving the other way and push down, help you push the aileron down. I've never seen that on a lightish aircraft. Is this? It's not a lightish aeroplane. Okay. <laughs> it's fa fairly chunky, this machine. It's okay. lovely on the stick. I mean, th these make all the difference to yeah. the flying. It will handle like the chipmunk. Um, it's really delightful Does within, it also within the envelope. Does it a trim tab? No. There's no aileron trims on this. It's just ah, a servo tab. That? Interesting. Right. Huh. Servo tab. Yeah. I haven't so, actually heard of that. Very good. So this is all metal riveted. Yep. Split flaps. Split flaps are hidden away under here. Oh, so, they're split flaps. Yeah, same as the Hurricane. Yep. Yeah. I'll pump those down in a minute. You'll see those in a sec. So are they non-lift generating flaps? Uh, they, all, they all generate some lift. They change the shape of the wing. Yeah. They're more drag than anything right. else. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. We have fuel Big tanks in each room. wing. Uh, 42 Imperial gallons on this one. Yeah. On the wing route. What's that little hole behind the kind of exhaust? Uh, that's your um, cool air. Cool air, right, okay. Yeah, air vents with the cockpit. Access panel, cockpit, we'll have a look at that. Yeah, we'll get around there. Okay, so this is all metal all the way down. I noticed that it's not flush rivets, and that's got again, it's not performance related. Not performance related so at all, no, it just doesn't need it. So just, just needs to work and that's, that's it. it, just hold it together, that's all you need. Right, okay. uh, interesting, you might, might have seen on the tailwheel video I did on, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Take this panel off, yeah. and this is completely empty, and you can actually sit down in here. <laughs> uh, right, one of the perfect. engineers showed us he could sit in there and have his cup yeah. of tea quite happily. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so the tailplane, again, the same right, construction. So stabs, okay, right. So very Spitfire-esque in, in my mind, quite curved. Yep. Fabric. So is this a trim tab? This then? is a trim tab, yep. So there's no servo tab on this one. That right. is purely trim. Right, okay. That makes so, sense so there. We're in the airflow for this, and it's a nice, light, elevated, huge flight yeah. control for what the airplane is, again. It really is, isn't it? So again, with the rudder, again, massive. Thumping great thing, and a funny shape as well, really. Yeah. Kind of triangle, triangle. Uh, 
It yeah. seems to be the North American way. They, they went for yeah. that kind of shape uh, until you got the Mustang with the, the kind of deeper cord. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is that a trim tab? That's a trim tab. Yep. So we've yeah. got um, rudder trim and elevator trim only on yeah. this aeroplane. Yes, I was thinking very... I'm always really impressed by these fabrics and how kind of tough they are. And you think it's just a really a bit of fabric. That's fabric. I'm guessing it's not dissimilar to something you'd have on a radio control plane or something. Almost identical, yeah. They, they, yeah. they cover them these days in second night. It used to be Irish yeah. linen. Yeah. Uh, and it's all hand stitched. Every one of these is hand stitched onto the rib. It's amazing. So, there's still the flight control down there. That's literally our control to the rudder. Yeah. Through our feet goes through through that cable. So where does the weight of this aircraft come from then? When it's not surely it's not. Maybe it's just my eyes, but it doesn't look that much bigger than. A chipmunk, it's, but maybe it is. It's quite a bit bigger than the chipmunk, yeah. and of course it's got the hydraulics in there for the gear and the flaps, yeah. Yeah, that adds a lot of weight. Yeah. Uh, bigger engine, of course. Yeah. Um, it is just a heavy machine, okay. and you can't lift the tail on this on your own. No, right. Um, so if you need to get the tail up, it's two or three people to lift yeah. it. This way is, yeah, this is like a small truck, isn't it, yeah. if you think about it. Okay, very good. So um, down there are steerable tail wheel. I say steerable, within ah, a few degrees on the rudder. Yeah. And if you want to make a steeper turn, like coming off the runway a minute ago, you have to yeah. put the stick all the way forward. Yeah. Like in the Mustang on DCS, exactly the same system. Yeah. So with the stick back, there's a pin that locks into the tail wheel mechanism. Yeah. And that allows the tail to turn with the rudder. Yeah. And if you move the stick forward past the neutral position, it pulls the pin out yeah. and allows the tail wheel to free caster. Right. Like a shopping trolley. Interesting. Um, okay. And that, that's when it becomes a bit squirrely on the ground. Okay. What's this exit here? Which, that is uh, your, your jacking point, oh, so lift right, the airplane right. up for services. Okay, very good. Uh, in here, we've got a tat in here at the moment, we've got a great big luggage space. Aha! Uh -huh. And if we take the box out, you'll see it is huge, cavernous. It is a big fat pod, isn't it? There you go. So all that space in there, and it goes down as well, we've got our smoke system in the yeah. locker below. Mm. That's enormous. You can see the construction in there as well. There's one yeah. of the, the ribs and formers at the back there. Okay. So. This lives, does this live at Dogsford? It does, yes. So if we scramble up, so the easiest way up, we've got a handhold there, and we'll just yeah. look on the wing. Front cockpit. Business end, yeah. So, ah, so this is more definitely more complex than what we used to on the chipmunk, okay? Absolutely. So I mean first things first, it's big. You get in there and it's comfy. It is, isn't it? That's so American, right? Yep, that's uh, big. Buick. Bigger than the Hurricane. When you get in wow. there, you feel you just loads of space. Yeah, lovely padded seat. Look at that. This is luxury compared to last time. That'd be a parachute usually on there. Yeah. But they're comfy as well, comfy enough. Yeah. So right hand side, the, the, the circuit breakers, yep. um, radios, things like that. It's yep. fairly modern stuff, of course, on that side for the safety side of things. Yeah. And the rest of it you see in here is pretty much. I'll take um, that off. You'll see a lovely spade grip. Just yes, look at that. Is that original or is that, that modified? Wow. Yeah. So the the Canadian uh, RAF airplanes had the spade grip. Yeah. Because you'd be going on to Spitfire, Hurricane, Typhoon. Yep. Where we all use spade grips in the uh, in the Royal Air Force. Yeah, funking great rudder bar between the rudders. What's that? So starter. starter. So yeah, we have an inertial starter on this. Right, so that's a spinning wheel, flywheel, right? That's it, exactly the same as the P forty seven on DCS. Yeah. So you wind it up, and in this case, we use our foot, so it's back on the heel. Yeah. Wind it for about fifteen seconds. Yeah. Uh, and when you've got enough speed on the inertial start, push it forward, and it turns the prop. Mm. Uh, and at four blades past the window, you then turn yeah. the magnetos on. Which is our red knob down there. Yeah. And hopefully it fires up. <laughs> okay, so at the top we've got a original directional gyro. I guess it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, it does work. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so original right. DI, original airspeed indicator. Yeah. Uh, altimeter. Turn Go on, what does the airspeed go up to then? Uh, on the clock, two fifty. Good luck. <laughs> oh, we'll get that downhill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a barometric altimeter. We've got a clock, which is literally. A clock, we've got a slip gauge and turn gauge, is that yep, the right thing to say? Slip, yep. Turn slip. A modern thing? What's the modern yeah, thing? Yeah, I've talked to the owner about that. That's our um, artificial horizon. Ah. Until the beginning of this season, we had the original one, which was yeah. on the back. Uh, but that's now a glass one just to help us with uh, UK weather. Good job. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, we've got VSI, which is in thousands per, thousands of feet per minute. minute. Um, manifold pressure at the top right there in PSI. Yes. No, inches. 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 Right, okay. So we use 30 inches there is um, 29.92 hexapascals. Okay, so. I'll take your word for that. Uh, RPM, now is that of, I, I always get confused, in well, in this case is it going to be engine, is it going to be prop? That's propeller RPM. That's propeller so RPM, So manifold right? pressures are our engine yeah. uh, readout, it's not speed, but it's the readout yeah. we have on the manifold, mm -hmm. and the RPM is on the propeller itself, which is what we're interested in keeping safe. Right, so you've got a red line at 2500-ish. Yep. Um, so 2250 is the actual red line, and there's a bit, bit there to show you, it's in the 
Yeah. So 2,250 is, is max RPM. Right. And what happens if you go beyond that then? Have you got to do something with the prop you uh, mentioned? You can slow it down, yes. So yeah. we've got a prop lever down here on the throttle quadrant. Again, yeah. the same as the um, P47 in DCS, this one, and yeah. the P51. Uh, so where it is at the moment is the decrease, that's lower RPM, mm -hmm. and we push that forward, that's higher RPM. Mm -hmm. And you just tweak that as you need it in flight. And as you set it, say about about there is 1800. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it starts moving, then you're either going too fast for that setting or something's starting to go wrong. So you need mm -hmm. to then work on the uh, overspeed emergency drills. Right. Which hopefully you know. <laughs> yeah, it's basically slow down. <laughs> okay, uh, so then we've got two temperature gauges. I'm guessing water in a wheel? Nope, so you've got free air, uh, is the actual air temperature outside, huh. uh, or through the carburetor, and yeah. you've got the carburetor heat. So when we put the carburetor heat lever down here, yeah, uh, you put that on, you should see that rise to about 50 or 60 degrees. Why do you need to know either of those? Um, carburetor icing. Um, right. So uh, it's not an injection engine, again, it's a carburetor yeah. aircraft. And as the air goes through the Venturi in the carburetor, it yeah. cools down uh, and you can pick up ice right. in the carburetor itself. So yeah. we have a heated carburetor, same on the Chipmunk, same on most yeah. light aircraft. Uh, mm. So you just pump some warm air in there to melt any ice that turns up. Okay. So your free air should give you an indication of whether you're likely to pick yeah. up ice and the um, the heated air shows you it's working. Right, okay, very good. Bottom right, I've got no chance of reading that. Bottom right is an ammeter. Amp, amp meter. Amp meter, yeah, amp meter, yep. Oh, right, okay. Uh, going left, cylinder head temperature. Ah, now that's something you only, I only seem to see in radial engines. Um, okay, because we've got that in our P47. You do, yes. Okay, so put it in green, keep it in green. That's it, yep, so 120 <laughs> degrees Celsius mm -hmm. uh, is where you want it for, for takeoff power checks. Mm -hmm. And keep it in the green, as you say, it's the 250 is the max. Yeah. Really operational. Um, which takes on to cooling. Is cooling fixed or have you got something Cooling's to fixed modify? on this aeroplane, yes. As in you've just fixed. got a... Um, just sorry. a cowling around the engine and right. that's been engineered to create the airflow as required. So if you change this into a performance aircraft, so you go to the P47, you can you can open and close those cows. Is that because you want to get less drag in certain... Yeah, so it, it helps with the drag, it helps with the airflow at different speeds as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously air is considered as a, as a fluid yeah. uh, and at different speeds it acts differently. Yeah. Um, so the speeds you're talking of P47, certainly as you start diving, mm -hmm. um, high power usage and so on, you, you need to direct that airflow slightly differently around the engine to help cool it. Right. Okay. Uh, that's all about getting the airflow around the engine. Yeah, really is an art form as well. When I, when I fly virtual P47, my whole flight is taken up by adjusting radiator flaps yep. <laughs> and trying to keep it. Okay, um, we've got a what, three gauges which I guess are, uh, I was going to say, it doesn't have coolant. No, it's so air cooled. This is the same as our chipmunk so gauge oil. we had. Right. So oil. exactly the same gauge, oil pressure, yeah. uh, oil temperature yeah. and fuel pressure. Right. So on the chipmunk the fuel pressure didn't work because we don't have a, a sensor on the pump. Yeah. On this aircraft it's quite critical when you have tanks to change. It yeah. doesn't feed from both, it feeds from one or the other. So it's nice to see your fuel pressure and if it starts wobbling and low, lowering itself you're probably running out so try to change right. tanks. Gotcha. Okay, accelerometer, accelerometer plus yep. and minus. Is that historical? That is, yep. So you've been up to 2G today by the looks of it? That's right, it's probably, probably my landing. <laughs> Thump. Uh, right, okay, we've got a ETB or uh, whatever, uh, uh, mag uh, magnetic, magnetic compass. compass yep. We've got generator light or oh, yeah. suction for instruments question suction for instruments yeah vacuum yep so that's the gyro control instrument yeah. we have sorry there and we used to be that what's the pressure above that i can't that's see that's hydraulic pressure oh right and so that's one that up in the green for gear operation or flap operation yeah uh, magneto control off left to right both and you're going to have why would you ever have anything other than both is it just for testing uh failures and, and testing of course oh, on the ground you, right. you check both on the ground but if you had a failure of one you could switch it off and save any rough running oil rad shutter push to open yep. okay so that will that literally you push the button in and pull that out and yep. it closes the shutter on the radiator helps cool up so warm up warm up right okay. on cool morning so i used that this morning <laughs> Is that engine primer? Yeah, engine primer, just to prime fuel one. Yeah, guessing. exactly the same as the P47 and the P51 and DCS. Yeah, so. we've got our um, uh, engine limitations, smash takeoff, 5 minutes, 22.50, max continuous, 2200, uh, and it shows us um, a manifold pressures there as well. Okay, very good. Uh, got some stuff down here, gear, lights, yep. um, landing flaps, we've got uh, 10 off, 10, 20, 30, 45. 
That's it. Yep. Um, but there's no actual way of moving it. That's down here. Flap lever. Why on earth is it like that now? That's because next to your leg. When you sit there, it's right next to your, your thigh, yeah. and you just grab it and undo the seat belt a bit. So at the moment, it's in the up position because that's where I parked it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a neutral position. So when we want to select a certain flap setting, mm -hmm. say we want them down now, we'll push it to down. You'll see the hydraulic operate and the peg will move. And when yep. it gets to the point you want, back to the middle. Yep. And then if you want to bring them up, it goes up and back to the middle. Very good. And gives us up and down, obviously, gives with the indicator down, yep. lights. Uh, got a throttle quadrant with pitch, thro pitch. throttle is the main one, I'm guessing. Throttle's this one, yeah, with the push to talk. Red mixture. Red mixture, and it's um, French, Canadian. Mm. It's in the wrong sense. So normally mixture is full forward is, uh, is oh, rich. Oh, that's awkward. That's actually lean. So when we're running, that's going to be back there for running. Yeah. And everything else goes forward, which is bizarre. Yeah, that's uh, weird. The, the American T6s have it in the correct sense. That would be Yeah, rich. awkward. Is the PTT work? It does, yeah. That's wow. what we're using it. So. Amazing. Okay. That. Um, we've got elevated trim there. Wow, that's a big old massive dually wheel. what's it, isn't it? Huge trim. Reminds me of BF109, look at that. And it's very sensitive as well actually, so you yeah. really only ever use it in that sense. Yeah, and it's all just direct cable connection direct cable obviously, yeah, and I'm guessing you've you got your rudder down there as well. Rudder there, yeah, and we've got a fuel wobble pump as well, I don't know if you can see that through my arm on the camera. Uh, yep, yeah, I get it. The lever here is a yeah. fuel wobble pump, and that basically helps you prime the aeroplane, you can see the pressure moving on the yeah. needle when you pump that. Okay, um, fuel tank selection, wings, or...? Yeah. so we've got off would be down here. Yeah. So there's our fuel off, uh, right tank and left tank. Yeah. And then way down in the bottom, really useless. Uh, yeah, you know, that really pages. is, isn't it? Look at that, just like the Mustang. Yeah. Pour it just a minute because you can't bloody see it. But 40, we've got 40 somethings in there. Yeah, about 40 gallons a side, roughly, yeah. Just okay. under, probably. Good. What's all this gumph behind you? That's your instruments for the rear cockpit. Oh, they're big, aren't they? Yeah. So the back of those gyros, this is your upper yeah. horizon. You can see the size of that. The gyro yeah. spinning in there and the suction. And everything so, yeah. so it's the rear uh, so hang on I always get this confused this is the student generally generally the student in the front and, and that would be the instructor that. and the way we do it is you're you're the boss in the front yeah and the not student but you know what I mean uh, customer in the back uh, customers um, uh, instruments are they uh, identical, identical? Yeah. And the flight controls, they're all linked. They're again. all directly linked, yeah. You yeah. don't have a nice spade grip in the back, you have a, a normal stick yeah. in the rear cockpit. But apart from that, it's identical in the back. Super duper. Yeah. And, um, and the canopy itself is kind of chipmunk esque and it's kind of windowed or whatever you call it. I don't know what yeah. you call it. Very good. Panel, yeah, so, and it's a uh, separate position, so. Incredibly spacious. Look yeah. how spacious it is. We'll pop you in and see. You'll see yeah. the actual views out there. So we have several settings on, on the canopy. This is the Mark II Harvard canopy. Yeah. Uh, it's not right for this aeroplane. You should have the Mark IV, which is mm -hmm. without this bracing mm -hmm. strap. So you have a big clear vision panel. Yeah. But the paint scheme it's in is a Harvard Mark II from the desert. Yeah. So you've got a nice early canopy on it. Yeah. Much more like a hurricane. So when we're up there today, your visibility much more like a hurricane. Right, okay. Per page on the, on the... Yeah, okay. Right, uh, anything else while I'm standing here? Um, not really. Uh, hand holds, got oil up here. I mean, you've got the engine, it, it looks like it's short from the ground, mm. but it's actually quite a, a long way yeah. up to the front there. It's all of this in front of you. Mm. Um, yeah, it's an aeroplane. Right, we are in front seat now. First uh, con conclusions are massively spacious. It's properly. I don't know what the words are, whatever an American car is, but compared to other uh, other planes have flown, uh, not flown, but being in Spitfire for instance, you're kind of snugged in like a bug. This is big and spacious, the seat is super comfortable, almost like a mini sofa, which is, uh, which is, uh, I guess it's kind of not surprising. Um, so it's super lovely, loads of leg room here, rather, you know, no problem at all. Everything is just super nice, really. Um, it's like flying an armchair, everything's just yeah. So is this what you think a kind of Mustang would feel like then? Yes, yeah, I don't think a Mustang when you sit in it. Yeah. Oh, right, how about that? P47 is slightly bigger if you sit yeah. in P47. But. And I think, uh, personally, in my opinion, it makes a lot of difference. If you're doing long-range sorties over, I know we talked a long time ago, but over Germany or something, and um, you've got to fly for, I don't know, 11 hours or something, it being something like this, it's so much more relaxing. Yeah, much more comfortable than, than trying to do a long-range flight in Spitfire. Yeah. yeah, noise and drafts and yeah. Yeah, cramped cockpits. The, 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 the Americans certainly had a, a comfier uh, design philosophy. Yeah, absolutely, and it's going to fatigue your pilot list. Yeah. But why does visibility above the top look so bad? Is that because we're at high angle of attack? It is, yeah, your tail's down on the floor. So as we take off, that, that will level out. You still can't see ahead when the tail's yeah. up, because that radio does take up a lot of space. Yeah. You use your peripheral, peripheral vision to, yeah. uh, to, to, to gauge your runways. 
I guess but in the air it's fine. I guess a big fat radar is always going to be a problem for visibility, you're right. Yeah. In fact, the Yak 52 is worse than this. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 oh, it's, apparently we've got access to a Yak 52 as well, which should be interesting. We'll work on that. Roger. Okay. So I'll close you in the front. You yeah. Kind of behind it. Wow. Very spacious. Look, how, <laughs> I've got like a, a, a foot of headroom. <laughs> and I'm six foot two. God, it's going to be so comfy compared to last time. Really nice. Talking visibility, the front is fantastic, and it's about the same seating position as a Hurricane. Yeah. Um, if you remember when we sat in the Hurricane, you're, yeah. you're about mid-wing. Yeah. And the visibility out there is about the same. Yeah. Uh, when you sit in the back, uh, your forward view is completely obliterated. Yeah. Uh, you've absolutely. got the roll you've got the pilot's head. Right. Um, it's just nothing forward. Yep. Which makes it very interesting when you're sat in the back instructing. <laughs> Roger. Uh, none of the wind kind of wind gauges in terms of flaps up and gear down or anything like that. It's all in here, isn't it? So, so we have gear. Uh, there's two little windows ah. on the wing there, and you yeah. probably can't see in this light. There's a little yellow marker just inside that panel. Yeah, I've got it. And that shows the gear locked down. Yeah. Uh, and if that yellow marker disappears, it's not locked. Ah. Um, I'll send you a link to the video for the gear swing because that shows that in detail. I've got yeah. my YouTube channel, so I'll send you a link for that. Cool. When I get a millionaire from YouTube, which isn't going to happen, but if it does happen, I'm buying a friggin' Harvard, Dave. I'm going to make you fly. I'll tell you what, they're called aeroplanes. Yeah, they are, aren't they? That is so cool. Okay, anything else while we're in here? I think that's about the front cockpit. Super. So, Dave, briefing. What are we doing? Yeah, so today we're doing the Battle of Britain experience. Yeah. So, what we aim to do, we, it's hard to do combat maneuvers without another aeroplane. So what we tend to look at is the defensive manoeuvres that the RAF would have employed yep. in the Hurricanes and the Spitfires. So the Harvard is basically um, a mini Hurricane. The handling wise it's very similar. Typical an aeroplane running up as we're talking. Um, so we're going to look at, um, once we're airborne, obviously we can't do the scramble either, so we'll get airborne in our own time. Once we're climbing out, we'll then imagine we're heading towards um, a vector from radar with, with the rest of the squadron, the rest of our flight, um, 100 plus bandits, yeah. uh, and we'll just consider the um, the emotions a new pilot might be going through at yeah. that point. So the, the adrenaline starting to build up, the anticipation of into combat, the unknown. Yeah. All you've got is a bearing, you know, uh, heading 150, Angels 20, 150 plus bandits. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, there's six of us here. Yeah, how are we going to deal with this? So the emotional side of what these guys went through is probably the most important takeaway from today. Yeah. So we'll have a look at that and we'll consider that on the way up, the anticipation of the climb into combat. We'll be around about three to 4,000 feet today. These guys are up at 18, 20, 25 sometimes. So unpressurized airplanes, no heating on oxygen. The physiological effect of that alone, just climbing in an unpressurized airplane, you know, all, your, all your fluids expanding inside you, your ears popping, everything going on, slight as head cold, uh, and you're going to be in big trouble uh, going up to those altitudes. So Why? physiological, it's because of the pressure change. As you get less pressure as you get towards 20,000 feet, yeah. uh, everything's just expanding. So your sinuses start to expand. And if you're slightly congested, yeah. the air's trapped in your sinus and can't escape. So it kind of wow. pops your eardrums and pops sinuses, headaches and things like that going on. So that's the, the guys we're dealing with that daily three or four maybe five times a day in the summer in, in 1940 yeah. so we'll try and consider that when we're going by the end of this you should be feeling if not sick certainly a bit tired yes. um, a bit fatigued a, lot, a week to recover last time so, yeah. yeah so on the way back in we're again looking at the uh, exhaustion these guys have been feeling they'll yeah. be dawn to dusk in the summer so what's that kind of four till 10 11 yeah. uh, on standby waiting to go the anticipation of that bell ringing every time the phone rings is it a call out and there's a cup of tea or it might be a call out and you're going to fight for your life so really the takeaway from this flight is just uh, a feeling for what they might have gone through we're going to do the fun bit yeah. they had to do the the, the hard work well, that's why they're called the greatest generation days. absolutely yeah so what we're actually going to do when we get up there then so we'll get airborne on 28 so we're going out that way yeah. today nice calm day so short taxi we'll depart off that way we'll head up towards peterborough um, along the uh, the drains towards um, Ely, so that kind of operating area, uh, and we're going to go towards about three or four thousand feet, uh, and then we're going to set up some scenarios where we're going to imagine an enemy aircraft. So as we as we join the fight, uh, we didn't quite make it to bombers. We're going to be intercepted by the fighters. Um, so the first one we tend to do is the maximum rate turn. So we were turning fighters. The RAF were great at turning. Uh, the Germans, not so much. They're boom and zooms, uh, very much like the Americans. So ordinarily, uh, as you start combat, the 109s and nines become diving in and through and back up. But if you can get one into a turning fight, that's where we're into a win. Okay. So the first one we'll do is very much like your dogfight videos, the gentleman's merge type thing, and we'll just go into a turning fight where we we'll imagine we're behind a 109 trying to pull around the corner. Yeah. And I'm going to put the aeroplane on its wingtip and pull it around around about four Gs from 140 knots or so, yeah. and just put it around. And the first demonstration will be 
when you manhandle it. Now I said earlier this aeroplane doesn't really give you much warning of letting go. Yeah. You can be flying quite nicely, pull the stick back and you'll focus on that enemy aircraft up ahead and trying to bring him into your gun sight, get that lead on him and you just pull a bit too hard and it will just flick out. Yeah. It might flick out, it might flick in, it will roll out the turn. Yeah. Either way you'll then be dead in the water and that aircraft has a chance to either escape yeah. or come round onto you. Mm -hmm. um, so a demonstration when it all goes wrong. We'll then do another one of those and I'll demonstrate just holding it in the turn and how we can feather the elevator. We're using the elevator on and off, mm -hmm. wing loading on, wing loading off, just to keep the aeroplane flying. Yeah. And doing that, we can pull a really tight max rate turn. Mm -hmm. So we'll do about two circle turn on that. Yeah. Uh, then we'll look at the split S, which is our preferred method of diving. Yeah. So with a carbureted engine, you can't just push because right. you'll get the rich cut as mm -hmm. the float chamber moves up to the top of the carburetor. Mm -hmm. All the fuel comes in, uh, floods the engine, and you get the cut and the engine stops for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is quite disconcerting. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't push in these aeroplanes, the same as the Spitfire and the Hurricane. Mm -hmm. So they had to roll and then pull to keep everything positive. If you're fighting 109 with fuel injection and you manage to get behind him, he's going to just push because he knows your weakness. Yeah, he's going to push and off you go and you've got to roll and dive and then there's a second lost as yeah. he's downhill very fast. Um, but you can also use it defensively. If you've got someone sat on your six, oh crap, we need to get rid of him. You can either turn it as we've just done or you can roll it and, and clear off. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll pull through again about four G's at the bottom of this split S. So it's a, a half loop upside down effectively. And then we'll pull back up the other way into a wing over. Yeah. And the idea then is to be unpredictable. So if you can keep the aeroplane moving uh, and keep that aeroplane from getting its lead on you yeah. by, by changing direction every time uh, into the dogfight scenario, we'll do a few of those maneuvers and level off and give you a chance to find the horizon again. Okay. Um, then we'll look at the barrel rolls. Now yep. we did barrels in the chipmunk, mm -hmm. so remember they, they pitch up and then you roll out to the side and you're upside off, down. You're hanging off your harness. That's right, yeah, and then you well. roll back in, that's yeah. it. So a lovely big corkscrew through the sky. Yeah. Uh, defensively, they're fantastic because yeah. the aeroplane slows down very, very quickly. Yeah. So we're going to imagine um, enemy diving in from our rear quarter, either left or right, we'll call it at the time. And the best defence for that, obviously, is to turn into him to ruin his shot because mm -hmm. he's then going to get his nose around here somewhere. But you also want to try and force the overshoot. So if you can pitch up and roll, yeah. he's coming through here at some speed and no chance of getting up there. Yeah. By that time you're upside down, you can see him. Mm -hmm. You have the choice when you finish the roll to either try and catch up yeah. or more likely get out of there and get some distance. Yeah. So we'll do a barrel roll left and right just to demonstrate an attack from top left and top right. Yeah. Uh, we'll also look at the aileron roll, which we did in the yeah. chipmunk, which is the straight pitch and roll. Yeah. And that's the same thing. It's all about decelerating the aeroplane. So guy diving from our high six we, we, we spotted him because we we're good pilots and we're looking out the whole yeah. time uh, our neck should be moving the whole time looking all around all the time um, and we spot him coming in so the best thing again ruin his shot by increasing the deflection angle mm -hmm. roll it over because now we're really slow he's disappeared at 400 miles an hour or so yeah. and we got a chance then to finish the roll and either Let's give chase or clear off yeah so we'll do that left and right mm -hmm. um, everyone wants to do a loop I'm sure you want to do a loop. Yep. Loops are fun. Absolutely useless in combat because yeah, they're course. so predictable. <laughs> so if we imagine looping, if we want to get rid of this guy on our six and we, we loop, it's nice and easy. Apart from the lead you give on the elevator, mm -hmm. you're going a straight line as a circle through the sky. Mm -hmm. And you're going to end up basically through your own wake here with the guy behind you still. Yeah. So useless, no point at all. Yeah. Off the back of that, uh, and we talked about unpredictability, you can pull into a loop and at the top you roll off. So we do a half cube as we did in the chipmunk. So yeah. it's kind of loop. And then when you get to the top, you roll it off. Yeah. And there's some unpredictability. If you're pulling up, the guy doesn't know what you're going to do next. Mm -hmm. And if you then just roll it out, oh, okay, he's got to think for a, a fraction of a second. So that mm -hmm. gives you a bit of distance. Might just ruin his shot. Okay. Uh, and by then, you'll be feeling rather rough, I should think. And yeah. we'll, we'll stop that and we'll head back. Brilliant. <laughs> so, well, what's the roll rate like on, on something that's out of interest? It's very good. Um, yeah. It's slightly more than the chipmunk. So okay. roll rolls slightly more than the chipmunk. But yeah. it's all fairly smooth as well, if yeah. I fly it properly. Um, I'll also demonstrate the servo tabs there. Yeah. Typical. I'll, I'll demonstrate the servo tabs there, and if you put too much aileron in, you can actually stall the aileron, then you feel it not ah. quite biting the air, and it goes, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you can stall the aileron at the same time, so yeah. we'll demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. And then it's back in for the run and break, so we'll head in from the east here. We'll find the airfield, run mm -hmm. down the runway, a nice break, maybe a roll over the top, and into land. Lovely. Um, but then as we're coming in, and we'll talk about this in the aeroplane as we're coming back, that fatigue is you're descending now. You've lost all your wingmen, mm -hmm. you've, you've lost your squadron. You've, you know, they, they talk about the sky being full of dots and angry wasps mm -hmm. everywhere to being completely empty and you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to find your way back to base. You might have been hit by something, you know, combat mm -hmm. damage or wounded or just tired and that adrenaline starting to come down. You've got to find the base, you've got to land this aeroplane and then you'll go and do it again. So yeah. that's the takeaway from the end of this hopefully is the never-ending cycle these guys had to do.
and you've also got to really con concentrate on your landing as well. Exactly, because, yeah, uh, yeah. These are not, uh, you know, tail draggers, not so easy to land on. Not, not easy machines at all, no, yeah. so you've got to get it right. And on a, a calm wind day, actually, yeah. it's slightly more tricky because you haven't got anything over the wings to help you. Yeah. So it's ever slightly faster on the ground speed yeah. to bring it in to keep it flying, so. Very good. Yeah, so that's what we're after today. All right, watch this. Clip up. Alpha Roger, surface wind calm. Oh, got a proper tarmac runway, how about that? Yeah, about bad, isn't it? Hello, uh, B17 base here. Yeah? Amazing. I closed my canopy. If you want to, yep. Alright, are you ready? Roger. Harvard rolling, isn't it? Harvard Roger, surface wind still calm. Your, uh, your brain isn't functioning at the speed it should do through lack of oxygen. 
How would they detect it then? They must have some tests they have to run or something? Yeah, it's very tricky to detect, but you just have to make sure your, your oxygen was uh, flowing. Uh, and obviously the altitude you're flying, when you're getting up to towards 18, 20,000 feet, it's minus 20, minus 30 degrees up there. So you'd have to keep, keep squeezing the oxygen tube, feeding your mask, to make sure there's no ice building up from your saliva. Peterborough down there, by the way. And it's Peterborough on the left, yeah. Oh. So we reached 4,000 feet. I just pulled the manifold back to 23 inches for cruise. And 1,800 RPM on the uh, on the prop. That's well below max continuous, isn't it? Yeah, a long way below, yeah. So it's actually a more of an economic cruise. And it's going to trim it. It's slightly right wing heavy today. But apart from that, she's all right. Would you like to take control for a minute? Have a feel. Yep. Okay, you have control. I have control. It's slightly right wing heavy, so you need just a bit of left pressure on the aileron. Yep. Oh yeah, my hands are up. Oh! I'm flying an aeroplane and I'm not being sick. Amazing. And you haven't crashed yet either. Yes, I haven't crashed yet. <laughs> Wonderfully responsive. Yeah, it's very light, isn't it? Yep. So once we clear Whittlesea below us, once we're over the, the open fence, we'll start manoeuvring. Roger. So we're cracking along now about 120 knots at the moment. 4,200 feet. Roger. Putting in a bit of pitch input just to see what it feels like. Yep. You'll see the speed will bleed off very quickly because it's quite a heavy underpowered aeroplane. Yeah. But conversely, you stick the nose down and it speeds up very fast. You have a little wiggle on your feet as well, feel how sensitive the uh, rudder is. Am I? Whoa! Ha <laughs> ha! So you don't need to push much, you just just the pressure, really. That is such a weird feeling. It's normally your that makes people feel rather unwell, because you're not used to that, that no. rotation. I'm not going to push it, but how how much travel is it there on those uh, rudder pedals? Oh, loads of it. That, wow. That's about two or three degrees you're doing there. It does a good 30. Wow, you could really stamp that, and that would... Yep. Amazing. Right, do you want to take us right side? We're down that river. Roger. Typically, I forgot to wear my glasses, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it's a river. That's a river, yeah. <laughs> Roger. Flying at Harvard. I'm flying at Harvard. Uh, how much am I trusting my instruments in the back here? Are they working? Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, the artificial horizon is crap, but apart from that, it should all work. Roger. All you really need is the uh, airspeed and um, temperatures and pressures. Yeah. One thing, uh, along with the theme of the day, is how exhausting just the basic G-forces must be. Just from, you know, not even from fighting, but just from... Just from fighting, yeah. And that's what I was saying in the briefing, the physiological effect alone of being at 20,000 feet unpressurized, with no heating, gotcha. that alone is, is bad enough, and then having to fight for your life at the same time. What's your barometric altimeter reading? What's your altimeter reading? Uh, I'm reading now 4,700. Yes, agreed. Okay. Just testing it. Right, should we do some maneuvering? Right. Do you, do you want to have a go at some turning first? Give it, give it a left and right turn. Good old, good old bit of roll. Hold in, a bit harder. A bit more, a bit more than there. That's a medium level turn, that's what I teach my PPL students. About 20 degrees. That's about 30. 30 degrees, yeah. Whee! And as you can see, 30 degrees isn't really going to get you far in combat. Yeah. And if you want to reverse that, go 30 the other way. Roger. And again, physiological conditions, your, your, your head should be on a swivel, you should be looking around the whole time. Yeah. So the mantras of the day, never fly straight and level in the combat area for more than 30 seconds. And the bandit that's going to get you is the one you didn't see. The forces are feeling are wonderful. It's just so shame you don't get that as a virtual virtual pilot. I can feel everything the plane does. Yeah, it's one of the things I miss flying the virtual side is, is that feedback. Yeah. Especially in your... Right, I think it's time to do some combat, don't you? Right, I'll just get a straight and level. Yep. Okay, and you have control. I have control. Okay, so we'll start with our max weight turn. And we're going to imagine now that we've just merged, we're just about to merge with a 109 on our nose. Yep. And we're going to throw ourselves into a turning dogfight. And this one I'm going to fly until the departure. So I'm going to manhandle the aeroplane until it departs on us and we're going to lose the dogfight. Roger. This is going to be round to the left. So good look round, make sure we're all clear. Temperatures and pressures are good. 
OK, so band is on our left, we're about to merge, and here we go, merge, rolling in. Oh. And pull. Three, 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 three. Oh. Keep squeezing, there's 4G, 4G, squeeze. Squeeze, here comes the buffet, and that's it, we're out. We're, we're dead. Woo! That's the airplane stopped flying. Ah. So I'll just level us off again there, we'll cover a bit of speed. That's good. So remember to squeeze your thighs and your stomach as much as you can to keep that G-force in check. Roger. So 90 left, then we're going to the right for our max rate turn. So once again, we're going to do a max rate turn, but this time a full uh, turning, so two turn circle. How are you going to win this one? So to maintain the turn, which I can do all day long, just using the elevator to put that wind loading in and out, in and out, all the way around. Yep. So here we go, get ready to brace, we're rolling in now to the right, ready. here we go, in, and pull, brace, uh, and that is our 4G, uh, and I can just keep that there just by moving the elevator on and off, on and off, and as I get that puppet, just tickling the aeroplane there. Now in combat, we're gaining now, we're on the inside of the circle, we're drawing the guy in for our deflection shot, and because we've slowed down now, our G's back about two and a half. Yeah. And at that point, there's a two-circle turn, a Hurricane would easily beat a 109, and that's guns, guns, guns. Roger. We're all out there. Woo! Now get your breath back, because the next one is quite a severe G-force. That's a workout. <laughs> yep. Right, the next one is going to be the most strenuous. That's going to be our split S, when we're going to roll and pull. That's because we've got gravity on our side, right? That's right, yeah. We're going to accelerate very quickly and be pulling out the bottom of the loop, effectively. Roger. So, what we're going to imagine now, we're just looking behind us and the 109 is dropping on our 6. So we said we can't push, we can't do negative because the yeah. engine will stop. So what we have to do is roll and pull. So, 109 on our 6, up we go, rolling over. And come down, just get ready to squeeze, and squeeze. Squeeze! 4G! 4.5! 4.5! And up into the window, we keep the G's going, be unpredictable. Roll it over the top, let's roll in there, put it back through. And now we just want to try and find that one in line to get on this six. And I'll stop it there because I want to make you sick. Woo! Beautiful day. So there we lost a thousand feet doing that split S, but we yep. gained uh, 120 miles an hour on the airspeed. Amazing. What was our V max there? Uh, 220 miles. Wow. Indicated. Fastest I've ever been in a non commercial jet. Yeah, not bad. Okay, so we're going to look at the barrel rolls next. We're yep. just going to turn us back to our river so we know where we are. And we thought the barrel roll in this case is going to be a, a, a hind quarter attack, a diving attack from the enemy. And we want to pitch up to slow down and turn into the attack to spoil the, the deflection shot. Yep. So I'm going to, obviously, uh, speed is king. So in, the, in real combat, you need to keep the speed up. Uh, the Harvard doesn't have the guts really to maintain a combat speed, so I need to put the nose down for that. But during combat, the speed fires the Hurricanes will be max chat and just keeping that speed up around the 300 mile an hour mark. Okay. So we'll pop the nose down, we're going to pull into a barrel roll to the right hand side. So we're imagining a 109 diving for our rear quarter on our 5 o'clock high. So I need to get 170 miles an hour indicated. We're watching him come in, and at the right timing, here we go with the speed, we're going to pitch up and roll towards him. So here we go, pitching up, and start the roll in. So now we're slowing down, we're turning off into the attack, and as we come over, he dies under our canopy, and we're now in a position at this slow speed, all this altitude, Dive in on his six, or oh, we can elect to get out of there and get some distance. And of course, heading away from each other at 300, 400 miles an hour, that distance soon opens up. Roger. How are you feeling? I'm absolutely fine, Dave. I'm in so much better shape than the last one. Excellent. We can do another one of those rounds on the left in that case. Roger. Just going to move the noise away from this little bit of river. This is a very noisy aeroplane, so I need to keep that in mind when flying around. Roger, roger. OK, so here we go then. Let's get the speed back, and we're going to go round to the left this time. Same thing, barrel roll. This time it's coming from our back left, on roger, our, roger. our 7 o'clock high. Here we go, coming up, back we come, and we're going to spoil that deflection. Turn. Ah. Rudder. Loads of roll, loads of rudder. Over the top, there's our 90 miles an hour, and now we can dive back in behind him. Energy, use the energy. Of our barrels. Beautiful, beautiful. You see I'm finishing the manoeuvres with the airspeed, just getting the height back, so I think it will nose the aeroplane back out so we don't head towards the ground too quick. Now we're going to have a look at the aileron roll. 
And this guy's going to be coming from our six o'clock high. So we're looking back, and he's on our six diving in. Obviously, we need the speed for this. I need to put the nose down myself. Yeah. So we've clocked him, and we know if we come up, we'll slow down and we'll roll so we can see where he's going underneath us. So here we go. He's on our six, and I'm pulling. And we start the roll now. And now he's slow. He's going underneath us. Look at the wingtip. Watch him through. He's under the canopy. And we're now rolling onto his six o'clock. Oh, we can make the distance and get, get out the fight. Beautiful, beautiful. All the way down to 3k now. That's right, yep. Okay, we said uh, looping is absolutely useless during dog fights, so we can have a look at some looping because it's fun. Yep. So we're going to change the engine parameters to this, that's 2000 RPM. Yankee Conning. Going to put my manifold up to 30 inches, that's my combat power now. Yep. We'll get our speed up to 180. And we've got a 109 sat on our six, and we're trying everything to get rid of him. And we're running out of ideas, so we're going to start pulling. So, a very predictable flight path. We're down at 60 miles an hour. And there we are again at 180, that's our weight. Exactly the same bit of sky we were just in, so that's absolutely useless. Yeah. And a one and I sat behind us quite happily, getting ready for a shot. As you can see, looping is really not worth doing. Yeah. So we said we'll mix it up a bit, we'll do a half cube off this one. Yeah. And as we dive in, when we get to the top of the loop, I'm going to roll out one way or the other, and be unpredictable. Yeah. So, diving in. So once again, the one and nine's on our six with this one. Unpredictable, let's roll it, let's do something, get out of there. And that'll just take the other guy a fraction of a second to work out what we did there. Yeah. To be able to chase us down. What speed were you at the, at the peak? At the peak, back at 60 miles an hour. Wow, so she's rolling at 60 miles an hour. Yeah, just about loads of rudder to help you yeah. out. How are you feeling? Perfect. And well, there's our combat maneuvers, as I said, they're all defensive maneuvers there. Beautiful, it was really good. I'm going to roll us back towards Peterborough and give you control back. Roger. Okay, so you have control. I have control now. All yours. Lovely. So you can imagine now, you, you, you've engaged your 1 or 2 109s. You've seen your comrades in the distance engaging themselves. You've lost your wingman, or you've lost your leader, and now you're all alone. There's nobody about. Now, what most people would tend to do at this point is, wow, combat's finished. Brilliant, I survived. And you start to relax. And of course, if you don't keep looking out, keep scanning that horizon, especially into the sun, yep. then you're going to get caught out by a lone 109 that maybe has been chasing you that you haven't seen. Yep. So even on the return to base, after all that combat, for maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes of doing that, you still need to be vigilant, you still need to look out, keep your head on the swivel. My, my confidence is increasing now, I can fly kind of and look around. And nice and straight and level as well. Very good. You said the visibility wasn't that good. I actually love it back here. I think it's great. It's very much like a Spitfire back there. Yeah, I mean, I can't see forward, obviously, but... Yeah. And you've got my head in the way, so if I did that, yeah. it's yeah. a lot more like it. Everywhere else is, uh, is beautiful. And it's good. Right, so the airfield's over by that forest there, so you make a left turn about 40 degrees. Okay. And so as we said in the briefing then, that, that adrenaline is starting to wear off now. Uh, and this may be your fourth or fifth flight of the day. Uh, you've been up since, you know, before first light, sitting in the deck chair, waiting for something to happen. Yeah. And that, that adrenaline has now surged, and it's starting to fall off the other side now. So you've got to keep looking out. You've got to find your home base. You might be 100 miles away. You, know, you might be fighting this on the south coast. Yeah. And you've got to find your way back. And then not only have you got to find your way back, you've then got to manage to land this thing as well. Yeah, right, and that could be battle damage. Absolutely, so your gear may not travel, you may have flight controls shot out, or any number of battle damage situations. You might be wounded, and you might have taken a, a, a bullet to the leg, or anywhere like that. And it's entirely possible your, your windscreen has been shattered, bulletproof windscreen has been hit. Yeah. And all these things will start to add up, and you can see why the attrition rate started to get so high. 
Dave, this gets a bit addictive. It does, doesn't it? Feel free to manoeuvre it, you don't have to fly straight level. Uh, what's the average course? 220. Two, yeah. I'll turn it around a bit, you see what it can do. Give, give it some money. Paddington Radio, Harvard, about 5 miles to the north east region. Harvard, Roger, 28 right, uh, QFE 1031, uh, 1 in the circuit, 1 reported joining. You have it climbing all the time. That's me. Roger. Yeah, it's quite easy to climb it from the back because you haven't got that visibility. Yeah, I think, I think that's what it is. It is yeah. The controls are lovely. The feel of it is the weight of it. Especially the roll. Beautiful. It's a very addictive airplane, isn't it? Yeah. And great feedback. It talks to you the whole time. Yeah. Right, so the air force down there are one o'clock. No tally, uh, visual. Big three in the air, Roger. I'm going to fire the run and break in a second, just looking at the circuit. I can't see any traffic, but I know there's one down there. The well cleared to the south west, changed to crack field. Are they taking it? Yep, I'll control, I'll show. So we can lose the south at least, let's do that fun, up we go. We'll lose it some height. Get the speed back, and then we'll get the nose down. The super cab landing! <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. Get that G in there, lose the speed. <laughs> super cab! Student Golf Mikey, Yankee, Roger. Harvard 30, final run and break, 30 seconds. Harvard, Roger. So here we go, running in. It's 2 8. Yeah, it's 2 8. Yep. So we're going to do the cardinal rule, never do aerobatic after combat, and we're going to do a victory roll. Off we go, and take. Circuit QNA to 1031, QFE 1032. Got back to the Yankee. There we are, a thousand feet from the circuit. Beautiful. Traffic on our right wing. Here is down, two degrees, two in the pits. And that's the hydraulics recovered, half flat. Speed is good, power is good. Harvard heat check. Harvard turning final to eight. Uh, local flight, X-ray Yankee. Uh, Roger, I'll just backtrack for Harvard and then get your way. Uh, Roger, X-ray Yankee. The main Grim Reapers videos are now being split between this YouTube channel and the Grim Reapers 2 YouTube channel. So if you want to see all of the Grim Reapers videos, please consider subscribing to both channels. And thank you for watching.